All right, good morning, everybody. There are some really good announcements, but we're uh, pretty far behind schedule, so I'm going to try to zoom through this part of it. So I was asked to uh, give an overview of what uh, voter suppression has looked like and what it looks like now before we get to the panel. Uh, so voter suppression is alive and well. It's uh, one of the biggest threats to our democracy. It's changed how it's looked over the years, but we're going to take a look, a few look at, um, different examples today so you can know what to watch out for. So when a lot of people think about voter suppression, you probably think of things like this. Does it look familiar to anybody? Yeah, be ready. So pay a poll tax. If you've never heard of a poll tax, uh, in the beginning of the year, you'd have to go and then pay to be able to vote in the election that would occur that year. Of course, this was not uh, blanket across the board. Uh, black and brown communities were targeted by this. Uh, and, and this is just so ridiculous in that you'd have to go pay. They would give you a receipt, and then you would have to take that receipt with you to any time you would try to go vote. And frequently, people would just say, oh, we're not going to accept the receipt. And that was one way uh, that the, the votes of black and brown communities were suppressed. Now, if we had more time, we would really dig into this. But this is a literacy test from Louisiana uh, that was used as, not that long ago, even in the 60s, this was used. So you would have to sit around when you would try to go vote. Um, of course, it was focused on black and brown communities. You would have to sit down in 10 minutes, you would do this literacy test. So I'm just going to read you a few of the questions. And if you get any of the questions wrong, they would tell you to get out because you wouldn't be able to vote. So here's a few. Draw a line around the number or letter of this sentence. What does that, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, draw a line under the last word in this line. Cross out the longest word in this line. Draw a line around the shortest word in this line. Circle the first, first letter of that alphabet in this line. And in the space below, draw three circles. One inside engulfed by the other. <laughs> That's six questions. It's a 30 question test. And you have 10 minutes to do it. And you have to get all of them right. And even if you did get all of them right, they would still send you out if they didn't want you to vote. Yeah. So even in the 60s, this was happening in Louisiana. How about this one? People, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, they're alive and well, too. Um, but they were a little more open with trying to suppress the vote. They would show up polling locations uh, and intimidate people out of voting. All right, we're moving, moving along here. All right, so these are a few changes in voting rights that eliminated some of those things. So they changed how they look now. So the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, uh, so that gave the right to vote to African-American men. But even after that, uh, there were still attempts to suppress the vote. Then we get to the 19th Amendment, and so this is the 100-year anniversary of the 19th Amendment. When people talk about they talk about how this gave women the right to vote, but what's not talked about is it gave white women only the, the right to vote. And in practice, uh, black women really didn't get the right to vote until 1965 through the Voting Rights Act. So when you see people and you get email, we get a lot of them from the university right now to celebrate the 100 year anniversary. You need to make sure that you're telling people, it's white women. We you need to appreciate that and make sure everybody's aware of that. Then we get the 24th Amendment, that's 1964, and that eliminated poll taxes. Now I would argue that uh, voter ID laws across the country are the new form of poll tax, but this is what got rid of those other kinds of poll taxes where you go get your receipt and then move along. Now, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, so this is a big one. There's plenty of documentaries around this. Uh, this is an important one for you to know about, but basically uh, it prohibited voter discrimination based on race, color, or membership. Uh, there was a Supreme Court decision in 2013 that eliminated a lot of the key protections from this. So the, uh, there are continued assaults on our right to vote. So here are a few news articles that came around in the last couple of election cycles. Uh, this is what voter suppression looks like now. So when you see federal judge allows North Dakota Republicans to block Native Americans from voting. Okay. This just happened. This, this article is from 2018, November 2018. And I can share all of these. I'll have um, it sent out in the newsletter. So I'd love to dig into it more. But people are familiar with that in, in Georgia, right? Okay, so that's a big example of voter suppression really recently. So Georgia blocks a move to close voting sites in mostly black so in Stacey Abrams' race, there were a lot of polling locations that were just closed, a lot of ballots that were thrown out. Very, very clear voter suppression happened there. So what can we do about it? What can we do about it? Uh, people are familiar with Stacey Abrams, so she started Fair Fight. Fair Fight is an organization originally just focused on Georgia and improving voting rights there, but uh, they're working across the country. And these are the states that they're targeting because they expect that voter suppression is going to happen here. And you know, look at that one. We're one of the ones that's going to be targeted. All right, we got through that really quick. Now we can get to the panel. I, you know, I teach classes on this, so I can talk about it all day long. <laughs> we got it done in 10 minutes. 
So first of all, we're going to introduce the panel. Uh, we're going to get this out of people's faces, so I want the light. Trump had 47.6 and 
Hillary Clinton had 47.3. However, there were 95,000 voters who checked every category except for president. 95,000 votes represents more than half of the total votes in Washington County. Operating on the premise that Hillary Clinton would have gotten 60% of those votes, she would have won Michigan and that, and that 12 electoral college votes. Um, so when we encourage people to vote, most people in Washington County are already registered to vote. We need to encourage people to do two things, in my opinion. First of all, to go out and vote. And number two, regardless as to which candidate won in the Democratic Party, right? The Democratic Party? Right. Even if your candidate did not win, please vote for the Democratic Party candidate. So hello again, my name is Trisha Duckworth, and I'm very happy to be here and be a part of this very important conversation. Just real quick, um, can we all agree that we are in some critical times as far as voting is concerned? Yeah, yeah. 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 And do we believe that no stone should be unturned when it comes to gathering votes for this election? Yeah. Right, right. Also, can we further agree that it's extremely important to educate our voters? And that's kind of sort of what I want to talk about. The voter suppression through the lack of educating voters who may not vote. There is a demographic that has been forgotten about for certain barriers that they face within their own communities. And so, due to this, we believe that everyone should each one reach one? Now, I've been guilty myself, right? And I'm sure we all can say we've been guilty. I was a part of the group that didn't vote because I felt like my vote didn't count. Then once I understood that my vote does count, I began to vote. But then there was another level of turning around and helping to educate others who may not be in that same position or who may not understand how important their voice and their vote is in each and every election. I was so grateful to hear the announcement of the young lady that said that they are reaching out to individuals who may not normally vote because that's the whole slew of votes that we could get to turn the election around. Not only that, there are some voters that don't vote due to intimidation. Intimidation of the language on the ballot. So they don't go in for fear of looking like they don't know what they're doing or they are just plain scared to attempt. So, so don't attempt and sit back and don't vote. And now we have all of these people, all of these people not voting. When we can reach out and I'm not coming in an accusatory mode because I myself have to do a better job. Each one reach one. Survivor Speak is committed as well because we are as well going to be reaching out in this election season to make sure that voters are educated, that they're comfortable, that they know what the ballot looks like. We cannot assume that everyone has the knowledge that they need to have to go in and successfully vote. I'm grateful also for even Miss Gail Summerhill and what she's doing through Ipsy Can I Share. Getting the, yes, let's give her a hand, please. please. Because we need to know about the candidates. We need to, I don't know how many times I've been to the poll, not lately, but how many times I've been to the poll and said, eeny, meeny, money, mo. Here you go. <laughs> and I just voted for whoever. We need to make sure that people are making conscious decisions because lives are on the line. So I want to say thank you again for inviting us into this very important conversation. Um, also to Ms. Gail for inviting us as well. Good morning, Washtenaw County Dems. How are you doing this morning? I'm originally from Ypsilanti, so I still keep a connection, you know, as far as in Washtenaw County, so I want you to understand that. Although, living in Macomb County, especially being the, the chair of the Democratic Black Caucus, 
there's a whole lot of work to do, believe me. And we're trying to do that work. And I think one of the things that you heard about was education. Um, one of the things that bothers me so much, and I'm not directing this towards any candidates or officials here in Washington County, I'm going to talk about what happened in Macomb. As we all know, Macomb County is one of the reasons that 45 is not 45, okay? But what happens is the suppression comes from not just people trying to keep, say, certain communities, especially communities of color, from not voting. It's also from the organizations. Because when, uh, I'll give you an example. Was the Washtenaw County Dems was, uh, you know, they helped us out. They did phone banking for candidates that we had running in Macomb County. Macomb County Dems wouldn't do that. So these are the kind of things that also suppresses the vote. Also what happens is when I talk to people that are running campaigns and different things up there, what they look at is they say, well, certain areas don't vote. So what do they do? Ignore them. And we know who those communities are. They tend to be people economically disadvantaged and, of course, communities of color. But then I ask them, I go, well, you know, the Democrats talk about this big tent party. Why are we still standing out in the rain? Because the fact of it is, is that if you're not willing to do something for us, how do you expect any progress? A perfect example is we had five candidates that were running initially in Warren. Warren's the third largest city in Michigan. We had zero black elected officials. Now, we were trying to change that. What happened was we got a few people through the primaries that ran in the general election, and all of a sudden what happened was, hmm, a lot of Dems turned into crickets. Now, of course, they sent in checks, but I told them that's the easy part. What we need is people to knock on doors. What we need is also elected officials to come out and give that, this is my buddy, you know, you can feel okay to vote for him. Because we know who, you know, the big voting block in Macomb County is. It's an older white, you know, group that tends to turn out and vote, especially with absentee ballots. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is they vote for who they're comfortable with. And people that are unknown, especially people that are people of color, They'll check another box just because of the fact that they're like, you know, I don't know who this is. And I don't see the support from elected officials or other candidates. And that's part of that suppression that we really are working to change. And for all of you, I'm sure, you get out and knock on doors and different things. But when you go into our communities, that education is important. It's not that simple knock on the door, take a minute, drop some lit, and off you go. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort and take resources. And one of the things that we're looking for is just that. It's for a real commitment to make a real change. Because if we continue doing what we're doing, it's just not going to happen. And no matter what that, say, the black community does, the brown community does, or anything else there, we don't have the numbers to make that change strictly by ourselves. We need everybody's help. And that's why I say one of the things that we talk about in our caucus is Believe me, we have every race and nationality and everything else. We work with all the communities because we have like a large Bengali community there. We also work with the Iraqi Chaldeans, people like that. Because we try to get them to understand we're all in the same boat. And the boat will continue to sink if we don't work together. Thank you. All right, those are good opening statements. All right, we're going to open it to questions now, and, all right, great. So come over there to the middle, start some sort of line. That'd be great. We have a microphone, too. So I'm hearing a few different key themes, uh, a need for party unity and more voter education uh, and getting people out into more activist sort of role. But feel free to ask any kinds of questions. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cheryl Irvin, and I'm from Ann Arbor. And I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, on the Civil Rights Movement. And I was one of those high school kids who was 18 and couldn't vote, but I did register people to vote. So I, this is very um, um, real to me. What do we do about those voters who are not being suppressed and don't vote? What do we do about them? And I'm going to give you a good example. In Ann Arbor, this past November, the school board put a billion dollar bond issue on the ballot. 
Ann Arbor has 120,000 voters. 120,000 voters. I mean, residents. 102,000 voters. That's how many people vote in Ann Arbor who are eligible to vote. 13,000 people pass a billion dollar bond issue voters for the schools in Ann Arbor. 12,000 voted against. So if you look at 100, I'm going to keep it round numbers, 100,000, and you add the 13,000 and the 12,000, that means 75,000 people didn't vote. They're not suppressed. They didn't vote. We made it easy for them to vote and when we pass that, that you can, anybody can vote. You don't need to have a reason to get absentee ballot to go vote or these things. We're making it easy for but they won't do it. So this is, this is what is bothering me. I do this in my church. I get all the candidates, we have a candidate Sunday and all of this, and get the materials and people come to me and ask me, what's going on? And when I put the table up, they go, we voting? What are we voting on? So they're interested. But let me tell you who's voting. The, the, the centurions, because we got some of those that are pretty close to my church. We got the boomers, and we got the Xers. That's who are voting. So we, and we know who the millennials are, because they are grandkids and, and children. So we know who they are. They're not a strange group to us. But so we need to be finding out what we need to do when th that our parents did to help us be more active. We got to help them. We got to do more talking to our own kids. Thank you. Yeah, like, let me respond to that one first, yeah, and the sure. panelists want to tackle that. So some of that speaks to how outside of presidential elections, uh, sometimes voter turnout in the county is 17%, which yeah. is 17% of the people making a decision for 100% of the people. I'm sure one, of, one or all of you would like to tackle that question. So in speaking to some voters, and we want to hear the heart of the people, a lot of people don't find the buy-in for some of these issues. <laughs> so if it's not something that they're thinking about, they won't vote. So I guess we have to strategically find a way to make people understand that it is all of our issue. How do we do that? We have to come back to the table and strategically plan as a group because we're all different, we all think different things. So if we come together as a group and really, really tackle that, I think that we can persuade voters. But again, there has to be a buy-in. A lot of voters too don't feel as if things that represent them as a person ever get on the ballot. So that is another reason why they are, they're discouraged to vote. Why am I voting about everybody else's issues, but I'm not voting about my own, so. And one, thing, one thing I would like to say about that is this. Um, you have to address issues. And a lot of times what happens, especially in community of color, we're not hearing our issues addressed. You know, it's one of the things that, that I recently did, that the caucus did, we had a summit. We invited state reps, county people, city council members, and basically people that were, you know, elected officials throughout the county. And they were like, well, what's it about? I said, we're gonna talk about issues. I gave them a list of just 10 issues. I said, we're not gonna give you a manifesto, but we're gonna give you 10 issues that we've heard from especially the African-American community in the county that need to be addressed. I heard back from two elected officials. Because here's the thing, that I guess to them, they would rather leave communities of color out than to actually, you know, do something. Now sure, they showed up for the summit, but to re-engage afterwards, I said, look, let's do something like set up a, a county-wide diversity commission so we can look at different things and try to address things. And that's why I said I heard back from a couple people and that was it. And so I guess what happens is, to me, what I don't understand, we spend so much time and so much talk and energy talking about trying to get these GOP voters to change over. You know, we're, we're gonna bring them into the right. Big Ten. Right. What about the people that are already there right. that you for, seem to have forgotten about? Yeah. 
So I really hope that candidates understand that when they're running, that if you don't address those issues, especially for young people like you mentioned, they're just going to stay home because they're going to go, you know, it's like the old Janet Jackson song, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Okay. So I want to throw a related follow-up question to that. Because you mentioned how the city of Warren has no elected officials of color, right? right? What do we think the impact on voter turnout is? Oh, it's, it's, that, that's huge. I mean, think about it. You have a city, the third largest city, that is probably honestly going to drop to fourth or maybe fifth. And the reason why it's going to drop after the census, who wants to go there when they see that basically it tends to be very regressive in the policies that are going on? When people of, of color look and see, is nobody elected here? Even in the county. No county commissioners of color. You know, I mean, Monique Owens basically, you know, did a historical event because she got elected in East Point. Now, East Point's demographics is very similar to Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti elected its first black mayor, John Burton, in 1967. So that gives you an idea of how long things are taking. Thank you. I heard. I to say. One of the reasons. Let me start. Let me start off by saying that there's no um, simple answers to complex questions, and that's a very complex question. Uh, more people vote from neighborhoods where there's a lot of money spent. In 2010. The Republicans in this country were able to turn around 700, 700 congressional seats, state congressional seats. And the reason why they was able to do that is because the Koch brothers spent $30 million to make that happen. There was a lady from South Carolina who was a Democrat. She had been in her seat for four years, and she was defeated. Not because she was doing a bad job, but because the Republican Party posted pictures on social media and on television who made her look like a prostitute. They didn't ever say she's a prostitute, but they said, this lady is wasting your money. This lady is unethical. This lady is immoral. They showed her putting lipstick on, putting a pair of fishnet hose on, and a big roll of money laying on the dresser. So politics are not clean. Politics are very, very nasty. And what we don't hear when, when we're outside of this democratic, these democratic meetings is what the other side is saying to the people that they are talking to. I'm going to go over here so I can see everybody. Um, so I think a big part of the reason that, that a, big, a big part of the reason that we have voter suppression is because people don't feel like the political system does anything for them. Um, and uh, uh, we should remember that it was designed to be that way. It was designed to be a system for the one percent, not for the ninety-nine. That's why uh, that's why they wrote in the Federalist Papers that uh, you know that that. Uh, that they didn't want, that they didn't want anybody uh, that, that didn't have money or land voting. Okay, now, now, now the whole the whole Constitution is set up that way. Okay, so for example, right now, 1.9 percent of the population of the country elects 42 senators. 1.9 percent. That's enough to sustain a filibuster. 3.9 percent elects 52 senators. That's enough to pass just about anything. Okay, you only need to get up to about 5.9 percent to get 67 senators. Okay, so uh, if we're if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna end voter suppression, one of the things that we have to do is we have to address the structure of the system that prevents us from electing people that actually represent the people instead of represent the five percent. Right. Okay. So I mean, for example. From uh, I, I, wrote a, I wrote an article about this. You can, you can go online and see it. You can see all of the math. I, I, I linked to a, to, a, to a sheet where you can see all of the math. Um, if we had one person, one vote in this country, if we had a one person, one vote standard, we would have 
another 106 members of the House of Representatives. Right here in Michigan, we're down by three compared to what we would have if we had, if, if everybody had equal representation uh, with the people of Wyoming, who is the lowest population state, we'd have another three House reps, okay? Um, but across the country, across the country, we are missing, because of the way that works, we are missing from a one person, one vote standard, 106 members of the House of Representatives, 982 senators, and 1,088 members of the Electoral College. Um, you can't have democracy when you have that. When you have that, what you have is you have, that's, that, in, that in itself is a massive hidden uh, uh, reason for voter suppression uh, that, uh, uh, that we need to address if we're going to address this issue seriously. So I think the key thing there is, is the failure of representative democracy. We don't have people that are actually engaging in representative democracy. And that's related to the low voter turnout, too, when such a small number of people are determined who the elected officials are. No, ex exactly. You, the, pe the, the people who are, uh, uh, the people who, uh, who show up are the people that, are, that, that feel like they get what they need. Mm -hmm. And the people that feel like they get what they need are the wealthy people. Okay? And the people who don't feel like they get what they need are poor and middle class folks, you know, working class people. They don't feel like they're represented. They're represented. They don't feel like they can be represented because the way that uh, the way that people get on the ballot has to be filtered uh, through 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 the parties. I mean, 99 point some percent of elected representatives in in, in the country are uh, come through the Democratic or the Republican Party, um, and uh, and people don't feel like they're welcome. I mean, that's, that, that's a fact. People do, I, I talk to people every day who don't feel like they want to be a part of the Democratic Party because of how corrupt it's been for so long. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know if, if we want to change, if we want to turn that around, we have to ourselves stand up for democracy in our party and in our country uh, at, at, at every level because, um, the, uh, uh, the Constitution is really designed to enforce the rule of the 1%. There's, there, there's, there, there, that's, what, that's the way that they, they designed it, and we need to stop worshiping it. We need to stop worshiping it, because that's worshiping their power. It's not worshiping ours. Yeah, that's right. All right. some nods on the panel, if I want to check in on this one. Any follow-up comments to that? So, I was that voter. I'm being very transparent. Um, what you're talking about doesn't represent me. People who are running don't represent me. We don't have a voice. What worked for me personally was again the buy-in. I understood that okay, I might not necessarily like some of the things in this party, but I definitely don't like what's going on in this party. So now, do I use my voice to come into this party and make some suggestions and fight for some changes? That's what I chose to do. But that's just me as a person. Not everybody has that same thought process. And other people have different barriers as to why they're not voting. And I think we need to speak to individuals about what they're actually going through and not assume that our way is always the best way of thinking. Uh, I come from a very segregated area of this country. I come from East Texas. Okay? I'm East Texas. Uh, I grew up knowing that I was going to always vote, and I had. My parents probably never voted. They didn't vote because not only of suppression, but also intimidation. And that's in their psyche. In fact, my brother, who was 15 years older than me, when Barack Obama first ran for president, we visited his home. And he gave us all of his Obama buttons, all his Obama flags, everything else he had that was associated with Obama. Not because he wasn't going to vote for him, but because it was not safe for him in the area that he lived in to make that clear to the people who lived in the surrounding area. So, to your point, everybody's story is different. And there's no prototype as how everybody should act. Uh, 
in this country, there is some corruption in the Democratic Party. But there's corruption in the United States of America. All right? And what happened in the 2016 election was more than Donald Trump getting elected. It meant a lot of boundaries changing because just before that we elected a lot of a lot of uh, Republicans as well. So so district lines changed, right? But the worst thing, in my opinion, was that Donald Trump was allowed to appoint more judges yes. in this country than any other single president. And what, what that means is further dismantling of the Voting Rights Act, right? Mm -hmm. The Voting Rights Act is the, the part that's, being, that's not being dismantled is being ignored. So people, don't, people are not safe in their voting areas in some places. <coughs> and people are not safe everywhere in Michigan. Not too very long ago, there was a guy named Robert E. Miles. Robert E. Miles, you guys have heard of him, right? Miles, M-I-L-E-S. Robert E. Miles was an anti-Semite. He was also a racist. He was also a voting intimidator. But he was known as a gentle brother Miles because he was also an evangelical pastor. All right? He stood in front of voting places and, and intimidated folks. And he lived in Michigan until 1992. My wife had, had, had an occasion to visit his hometown one night, and we were late traveling there, <coughs> out of there, right? It was not, well, I don't know about my wife, but it didn't feel safe to me. And that's less than 30 minutes from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So don't assume because my story is one way or your story is one way that that's the way it is for everybody. I was the lieutenant governor for the state of Michigan, and the one place that were, were diametrically opposed to meeting with me and never did the whole time was a place right outside of Robert E. Miles' hometown. So I'll be conscious of the time uh, and make sure everybody that has a question gets their question asked. Can I see a show of hands for people that may have a question that they want to ask? Just so I have a sense of, okay, we got a very number. Okay. All right. Oh, that's the line right there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's do it. Can I make one quick? No. 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 Please, yeah, please take the question. Yeah. yeah. Happy to chat in the parking lot about comments. <laughs> okay. What happens? So you want me to go over here too? Right. Only if you want to see all of us. Yeah. Pardon me? Only, never, only if you want to see all of us. You only have to go over here. I want to see all of us. I'll see all of us. Questions for everybody. Uh, good, morning. good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gail Summerham. Cute little black girl. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am happy to hear the panelists so that you might have a little understanding. One of the questions that uh, you said is, you don't know my story. You can't judge me. Why don't people show up at the pulpit? For those of you that know me, okay, raise your hand. Okay. So for those of you who know me, I'm pretty outspoken. I speak straight on. It's a little uncomfortable sometimes. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> what we heard was we lost Michigan, and who do we need to win? I believe I heard them say women and African American. Yep. Yep. Would that be true? Yes. yes. Okay. So raise your hand if you came and talked to me and asked me what should we do, Gail? How many? Two? Can I get one? Two? Three? Okay. So if you didn't talk to me, what does that say? Don't be quiet. Is that a question for the panelists? <laughs> Don't be quiet. <laughs> if you didn't ask me to know why I believe, as a cute little black girl that talks to everybody, 
then you don't know what to do. So the same thing that happened in 2016, we can pretty much guarantee it's going to happen again. Would you say that's right? Raise your hand if you think it's right. Raise your hand if you're scared about it. Okay. So then everybody that's raising their hand that did not come and talk to me, you can say, I'm responsible, right? Yes. Come on now. Yes. Come on. Did you just say, I'm responsible because you could have been talking to me and I, you could have followed me, right? Right. I'm you responsible. Know, we, we got a lot of other questions. Did you ask a question? I'm making a statement. <laughs> because they understand what I'm saying. So you want to chime in to say what's happening, why it's happening. Thank you. Gail, one of the things that's happening is just this. The party has to make actual changes and not just talk about it. Because we hear so many good words, and I go to so many what I call kumbaya meetings. We just get together, and everybody's so happy, and everybody's so doing all. But then when it's time to do the work, and it's time for the representation, it doesn't show up. I mean, and like I said, I'm not blaming any of you. That's not it. I'm certainly not throwing stones at allies. I don't want to do that. But you have to understand that if we're not there, if we're not at the conventions, if we're not part of you know, the, the committees at the, at the state level, if we're not there involved, then, like Gail said, how are women, how are communities of color, especially African Americans, going to feel like, oh, I'm welcome there. I should go join, I should be involved, if when they see that everything that's talked about is other than, than that group, or those two groups. So you have to make a change, you have to make a difference. And you have to talk to people. And like I said before, the canvassing has to be different. You have to go and talk to people and find out what's on their minds. Not just drop some lid off and run off to the next. Yeah, it takes time. It takes energy. But do you want to win the election? Then that's what you need to do. So I just want to pose a question to us all. By show of hand, based on the statement that Ms. Gail made, how many of us have personally reached out to voters that don't look like us? That's amazing. We got a good party. It's a good party. That's amazing. <laughs> well, in this room, but guess what? There are a lot of people that don't reach. Because I'm glad to see all these hands. I want to know where did you go and who did you talk to? Because there are a, there are a bunch of, of individuals, low income, African American, they don't get in these conversations. They're not invited in. Nobody's going to their homes other than to knock and drop the literature off. But we've got to start having some real open conversations without judgment too. That's very important. Because we come in with our preconceived notions about what we feel people should know. Oh, you don't know that? You haven't heard that? We've got to drop that, humble ourselves, and have empathy for voters that don't have the same education about voting that we do. I have to comment on that statement. I have a different view. And I'm going to tell you what my view is. If you do voter registration, you're going to go into areas where most folks don't go, right? And one of the places that we go to as NAACP members is the streets of Washtenaw County. Who lives on the streets of Washtenaw County? Homeless people, right? And total disclosure, right? There's nothing that I can say to a homeless person who asked me how will their lives be different based on who they vote for? I can't answer that question. I don't think anybody in here can answer that question. How is a homeless person's life going to be changed based on who they vote for in any election? And that's the question I get from almost every homeless person that I try to recruit, not only to register to vote, but also to go and vote? That's a difficult question. 
So I see that our line has grown, so I'm just going to ask another question. We have Ed, our deputy clerk here, who's going to close us out at the end. Ed, how long do you think you're going to need up here? Hour and a half. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I can be as long or short as time allows. Can I give you 10 minutes? Is 10 minutes good? Yep, sure. Okay, we, we can do some more questions. Real quick question. What impact do you think that the changes in the absentee voting law, any reason absentee voting, as well as same-day registration, are going to have both on suppression and apathy? And how do we get people out to vote? How do we get them interested, given these new changes in the law? Perfect. Ask the questions quick like that. That's beautiful. Thank you. you don't, no, you all don't have to respond. If one of you wants to do it, let's do it. I'll just say this, if, again, you have to educate people. You have to get them to understand the process because just giving them an application and, or you know, registering to vote but not giving them the information they need so that they have an understanding of what in the heck they're doing when they are voting, it won't make a difference. Because it doesn't have to just be at the polls. Even if you're sitting at home with an absentee ballot, if you look at it, we know how these proposals are written. You know, if you don't have a law degree from Harvard, it's like, how are you going to understand it? So the thing about it is, that's where all of our organizations can help. Because if you talk to people and you know that they don't understand, tell them to call you. Tell them to say, hey, you can reach out to me or reach out to our organization, and we can sit down and just explain it to you. Not tell them how to vote, but explain things to them. So that education is so important. It's like you said, you, you can't talk down to people. You can't go into people that are working two and three jobs just trying to keep a roof over their head and food on the table and expect them to be so politically active. That's unrealistic expectation, but that also tells people that really you're not understanding or you're not trying to care about their situation. So therefore, do what you can to help. Thank you. All right. My name is Hugo Mack. I have a question for you. Now, in terms of voter suppression, part of the problem that I think we've got to look at is restorative justice. Over 38,000 people incarcerated within the Michigan Department of Corrections right now. Over 90% of them will come out. Everybody in the Washington County Jail eventually will come out. So the problem is, how do we incorporate individuals that are returning citizens? Fortunately, in the state of Michigan, a person with a penitentiary experience, they can vote. A lot of states, they cannot. I've had people with a penitentiary experience been allowed to vote in Florida, the outcome would have been tremendously different. Al Gore would have been the president. So how do you incorporate <clears throat> encouraging individuals with penitentiary experience to get involved and not feel stigmatized and outcast? So our group actually is working on a reentry project that meets returning citizens before they actually come home to make them aware that when they are released, they are able to vote as soon as they come home. A lot of people don't understand that. And actually, when Obama ran the first time, there was literature going out to people to tell them that if you're a felon, you cannot vote. So we have to change the narrative amongst our returning citizens and let them know that there is value in their vote as well. Let me jump in on that one because I'm kind of like on the panel just a little bit. I'm over here. Uh, so, so you're going to want to watch the current events around what's going on in Mississippi because there's a case there. Because in Mississippi, if, you have, if you're convicted of a felony, you can never, ever vote again. That's what the law is right now. But that's going to be challenged uh, to the Supreme Court really, really soon. So keep an eye out for that. I think it's already at the Supreme Court. Uh, and the things just changed a little bit in Florida. You probably saw in 2018, uh, people that were convicted of felonies got the right to vote back. But, you know, the forces of uh, trying to destroy democracy out there have instituted a new kind of poll tax on them where they have to pay some sort of fee to get the right back. So we need to be aware of that stuff that's going on. Okay, next question. Yes, I'm wondering if there are any organized efforts um, in terms of getting non-voters to vote in this election. All of us here recognize how critical it is and it, these issues such as Medicare, Medicaid affect every one of us. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any organized efforts that you would advocate that we join, that we become part of, that you have seen to be effective in the last few years. The answer to that question is I don't know. Okay. But what I will say is this, 
I want to encourage everybody to participate in the census. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm doing that is because, as you know, uh, this administration has understaffed and which causes the census department to underserve, okay? So we need to make sure everybody who should participate in the census are participating in the census. So, and for those of you who don't know about the census being understaffed and, and underfunded, the NAACP right now in Prince George County, um, Maryland, has a pending case right now against the United States Census because of the fact that it is underfunded and is underserved the people of that community. So I believe the young lady in the back um, talked about a group that, she's gonna be coming up to ask a question, so hopefully you will announce that again. But she just talked about those efforts of reaching um, individuals that are not voting. Also, um, I do know that Ipsy Can I Share is addressing that as well um, through, by means of social media and getting that out. But we also have to understand not everybody's on social media. And some people don't use the internet. Um, some people don't even have access to the internet. So we have to think about it across the board and make sure that we're reaching every voter that needs to vote. All right, I have two comments for that. So one of them is Fair Fight. Uh, it was in my slideshow, Stacey Abrams organization that's gonna be doing that kind of work. And the second is the points about the census. We will have a one-pager on our website in our newsletter that provides information on the census. So keep an eye out for that. Everybody should participate in the census. Everyone should participate in the census. Whether you're a citizen or not. It does not depend on citizenship. So the Trump administration is trying to intimidate people out of taking the census. Uh, so dispel that myth and encourage people to participate. We've got about 15 minutes left. So we started Zooming once I put the pressure on. But uh, we can slow it down just a little bit. I'm a fast talker. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Jolliffe. I have a question. Can someone give me two examples of active voter suppression in Washtenaw County? so that I know what I can do about it, so what we know what we can do about it. That's quick, that's a good question. So I live on the borderline, I work in Washington County, but I would say educating voters, educating voters, because again, why you, a lot of people think that that's not suppression, but it is, because people aren't being invited into a lot of these conversations. Perfect example, I got a call from someone and they were talking about going to the endorsement um, in March convention, the endorsement convention. And I spoke to that about to someone else. They've never heard of it. They had never heard of it. So why are we being excluded from things like that? Everyone should know about these things, right? There has to be a reason why we are being excluded. So things like that, that is suppression. And that is happening everywhere, even right here in Washtenaw County. Just to help jump on that, so Dirk here, I, I saw him give a presentation. Do you want to come say? What, really, no. no. So something that um, I saw that was really interesting, he was showing a map for in uh, a township in an area where there was a large population of African Americans living and where the polling places are. And that all the polling places are outside of where those people are. And at some of those places, you actually have to cross over highways to get to, and that's their closest place to vote. And so that, to me, is a really clear example um, of what we're looking at. And when we look at participation rates in these areas, too, which we can see in the Salini as well, like that, that shows us some suppression that's happening right here. Perfect. That was one of the points I wanted to bring up too. So it's only a county there are a lot of issues with, with the location of some of the polling locations. That would be an issue you want to bring up with the township clerk. Oh, no, 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 no. There, there is a second issue with suppression and Tell representation. Okay. Tell us the microphone though. In the last, you know, this, it's, it's outside my area, but if you look at the numbers, for the last 10 years, 15 years, we've lost representation at the county commission level. It went down from 15 representatives of the county commission in the 90s down to nine. And when you do that, the majority will win. Whoever is the majority, when you only have, say, one representative, that representative is going to represent people who look like me. If you want better representation, you want those people to address issues that affect your community, we need more 
representatives. So there's two examples for you. One, polling locations. Two, the way we cut representation so that smaller communities can't get a voice anymore and they're dominated by the, the biggest group. Thank you. All right, so I have... Um, so my question is around thinking about, um, a lot of times I think about that people talk about democracy like it's an individual action, and I think we really need to start thinking about it more collectively. Um, and so thinking about how do we help one another, how do we and help other people to see our vote as power gathering, as community building of power, so that we can actually help to center the interests of those who are most impacted, like young people, people who are living where we have the biggest health disparities in this county. We know that there are a lot of health disparities um, and education disparities, life circumstances, people who are incarcerated, people who are intimidated, as we've talked about, people who just don't have practice at it. Um, and help them to understand when we're talking about like homeless people that it comes to policy and that there are policies that we can be doing um, at the local level, the county level, the state level, the federal level that need to be more aligned and if we're not actually electing people to do that then we're actually cutting ourselves off. Um, and so um, kind of thinking about how we can do that and one offer I'll make to this is something that I saw that I would like to see grow and I'm happy to work with others to do that here, um, which are thinking about doing people hosting like these different house parties where each person comes and they're only focused on one of the candidates, one of the issues, and you come together, you share that information in that party, and within two hours, now you've gone through the whole ballot uh, together. And, um, and that, how that could be something that can actually help us to do this each one reach one. So that's an offer I want to put out into this space. Um, and um, I'd love to hear if you all have other ideas of how we could do that, thank you. So I think that there has to be a buy-in by the educated voters to really dig into the issues of voters that might not necessarily necessarily feel that they're represented. So, and I look back at, so when the NAACP first started, what was it, 70 members? Six of them, seven of them were black, 63 were Caucasians. It's going to be all of our issue, and I think sometimes people think, because they're not homeless or because they don't have these different barriers, it's not necessarily something that they always look at. So I feel like we have to have empathy in what other people are going through and their barriers and really seek outside of ourselves to really help them. I would encourage everybody to continuously check your voter registration card. And the reason why I say that is because in some locations, uh, the clerk's office will mail out a letter to you, and that letter will say, do not forward. So if you're not at that address, or never respond to that, you will not be allowed to vote in, in the next election. And uh, that's one of the things that we'll do as far as when we're doing canvassing. Because you know, most people do have a smartphone. So if they're not connected, the one thing we ask them to do is bring up the Secretary of State's website and see if they're registered, you know? But also they need that education and, and that connection a lot of times to elected officials. And that's where all of you can really make a difference. Because when you hear of a problem, you know, if you know that someone can provide some assistance for that, connect those people. Because then if they actually see some action happening on their issues, they're more likely to want to get involved or at least vote. And that's really what it is that we want. It's really easy to check your voter registration. You just gotta go to Michigan.gov slash vote. Real easy. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left, so if you want a question, you better get in line. We're going to cut it off soon. I'm making it quick. Okay. <laughs> At least an hour ago, you said you were mentioning um, inviting a lot of elected uh, representatives in your region to learn more about 10 issues of uh, particular importance to communities of color. And as a matter of strategic communications, it feels to me like we all need to know what those 10 issues are. Can you inform us about that? Well, it was, one thing was a lack of resources. People don't know a lot of times that things are out there that, that are available. So what it was is like, how do you better communicate? And the thing we asked the county and the cities to do is get it out there. If you're sending, you know, electric bills, let's say, or you're sending whatever it is, water bills, why not put information out there on who people need to talk with 
or communicate with in order to know. And also, spend some money on advertising. You know, instead of spending all this money about, oh look, everything's so great and everything's so wonderful, that's fine. But also advertise where resources are available. One of the things we also found out about was, we asked the county and the cities within, how many companies of color are you giving contracts to? Because the fact of it is, that's an economic impact. You know, that makes a difference because then you also have more people working. Those kind of things really make a difference, but oftentimes they're not thought of. And of course, police and fire. Do you have the diversity in your police and fire departments that reflect the communities? And then that was something I said, it doesn't have to be just the African American community. But like I said, where we're at, we have so many different, different communities there. Are they represented? Because the fact of it is, the understanding a lot of times just isn't there. And you need everybody involved in those places. And hiring as well, That's, that was something. Because the thing about it is, I'm big on careers, not just jobs. Okay. So, and one of the places you can still tend to find middle class employment at is in local government, state government, and federal government. So my thing is, what are you doing <laughs> to increase the number of African Americans and other people of color in your employment process. If you want to email us that the list of 10 things, sure, we can send it out in our yeah, newsletter too. That'd be cool. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fairfield, the uh, chair of the Western Washington Dems. I actually wanted to answer two of the questions that were just recently brought up. Uh, first one I want to address was the question about giving examples of voter suppression here in Washtenaw County. I will give you one, I know this is gonna sound insane, but I am a victim of voter suppression in Washtenaw County. I live in Bridgewater, I know it's insane. I live in Bridgewater Township, which is the second most Republican voting township in the county. My county clerk has not yet updated the, or I'm sorry, my township clerk has not yet updated his, our website to um, talk about the new law about uh, absentee voters. Our website still says all the things about you have to be over 60, you have to be uh, uh, expected to be out of the voting, you have to be disabled, whatever. He has been told three times now in the last year by myself and others that he needs to update the website. And he refuses to, literally refuses to. Does not understand why that needs to be done. He's not doing his job. Secondly, he um, is, I am, have been on the permanent absentee voter list in my township for almost 10 years now. I have always received a, a, a request form to fill out if I want an absentee voter um, ballot. I haven't received one this year. I called him and said, I expected to see that. And he said, well, they just went out this past weekend. I said, no, the absentee ballots were supposed to be going out this past weekend. The letters go out before that. Oh, well, I'll check on that. He called me back, left me a message, and said, they went out this weekend, meaning last weekend. I still don't have one. I left him another message and said, could you confirm for me that you actually mailed me one? Haven't heard back from him. <clears throat> the third part that he has done is he has uh, been told that he, it would be really helpful if on his website he would put uh, information about what his hours are the weekend before election day. And his answer was, well, we're only required to put it in the paper. And that's what I did. And he was asked, well, don't you think it would be helpful to the voters if you put it on the website? I'm only required to put it in the paper. That's his answer. So there's an example for you of voter suppression in Washtenaw County. And the reason for that voter suppression in Washtenaw County in Bridgewater Township is the large majority of the township votes Republican. They don't care about those of us who actually want to educate voters. They don't want to educate voters. They don't want us getting out and voting. So what are the dynamics of the board there? They're all Republicans. <laughs> Have you gone to the supervisor? Uh, yes, actually we have, and uh, the ACLU has sent him a letter 
and told him get his act together or else. Um, Maybe he's up for re-election this year? Um, yeah, 2020 is. Yes, he season. is. Yeah. Uh, likelihood is nobody's going to run against him, right? <laughs> Thank you. So, we have, we have Great behind the scenes, I am not running. <laughs> but, wait, there was one other question that came up that I wanted to address real quickly. Real quick. And that is, um, people asked about how you educate people about voting and who their choices are and what, who the people are who are going to make the difference. And I'm going to, I have two words for you. Voter guide. Please help us get the voter guide out this year. Yeah. All right, any questions, last questions? Time for one last question. We got three minutes. Okay, so I'll be real quick. So, in the interest of being solution focused, what tangible programs or initiatives can we start to actually go out to the communities, such as Southside of Ypsilanti, um, to actually get folks the information that they need to get them stuff like the absentee ballots, because we have no reason absentee voting now? What actual tangible things can we do to make these things happen? What a great question to close on. Thank you. Very good. Amazing question to close on. Uh, one of the things that Survivor Speak is looking at is actually doing voting fairs. And what that will look like is going into the community with the bouncy houses and the hot dogs and resources for the community and introducing the legislators there. A big community party but it allows the community to feel the buy-in, they get the resources, they get to talk about their issues, they get some good food, their kids get to play, it's a family setting. We have to change what we're doing back to the family, the community that builds each other up instead of tearing each other down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody can answer, you know, one. That's the last question. One thing I would say is, I, I grew up on the south side of Ipsy. You know, you have Park Ridge Community Center there. You know, you have the perfect facility to have that type situation, town halls, informational meetings, things like that, that, you know, let's face it, usually, you, you know, you show up with some good food, people are going to show up as well. So I would say, you know, spend some money on that. That will definitely connect with the community, but that's where you also get a chance to meet people where they live. Because that's what you have to do. Because a lot of times, for those of us that are politically active, yeah, we'll travel all over the state to go to things that we want to hear. But for most people, you got to go to where they're at. That's the only way you can do it. All right, I want to thank our panelists. We should all think that. Thank you. Yeah, right on time.